I'm Teresa Larkin. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Wollongong. I teach and do research, which I love. I love having the balance of both. So I teach anatomy to medical students and my research is in the broad area of endocrine research. So looking at hormones and that's hormones in people, in humans. And specifically, I suppose my main things are looking at stress hormones and hormonal impacts and influences on mental health issues and behaviour and then also during pregnancy. So I've always loved science. I love that there's so many unanswered questions and I think most scientists have a curious mind. I think that's what drives them. And with this particular area, I remember I did neuroscience in my second or third year at uni and we had to do a fairly big report that we hadn't done previously, that style. And I looked at sex differences in the brain between females and males. I had to do a lot of my own research and reading and write a report on that. And I just loved it. There was so much to read. I wanted to read more. It made me think of other differences, you know, in terms of behavior and thought processes. And obviously hormones are the biggest influence in that. So males and females obviously have differences in some of our sex hormones, although our other hormones are, have no difference between genders. So I guess I was really interested in how hormones affect our brain, but then hormones more generally how they affect our thought processes. And I'm also really interested in pregnancy and that physiology that happens during a pregnant um, gestational period. I think it's amazing that a, a woman can grow a baby and that, you know, our physiology is adapted for that and to think of all the changes that happen and they're really hormone driven. So yeah, I love, you know, that and, and it's the circle of life then. So, you know, all, all positive human aspects. So I really love that where I work at the medical school and on a university campus that we're exposed to so many different people. So I collaborate with a clinical psychologist and I really love what she's brought to my area of research. So she's got a real clinical outlook and she sees patients with mental health and she sees the impacts of, of um, mental health and disease. She knew that I was really interested in the hormones that are relevant to those processes. So. We just got talking one day and realised that that could be an interesting collaboration. I love neuroscience and how the brain works and all of those cognitive aspects, so that was a perfect link. And then similarly with the pregnancy research, it was actually an osteopath medical student who spoke to me about what he saw in clinical practice in terms of during pregnancy a lot of women would have lower back pain and he thought that that was related to some imbalances in their hip muscles and possibly my addition to that thinking was that stress and stress hormones can also affect some of our perceptions of pain. So yeah, it's great to get influences from people that are working clinically because as a researcher, I love the area, but I don't have a clinical aspect. In our research, especially because it's involving humans, we can use a mix of quantitative and qualitative data. So for example, in the um, pregnancy studies, we look at um, numbers. So we take blood sometimes, we take measures of muscle thickness, we do blood pressure. So lots of things, heart rate, where we can actually measure and there's a number and there's a quantity. But because we're also looking at influences of pain, we need perceptions. So we need the participants' perceptions of pain. So we can also use quantitative data because we get the participants to score their levels of pain on a scale. But what um, really adds depth to that data and those results is that we can then have interview questions and they're more open-ended. So then we can get just an open-ended response from the women and that brings up things that are not necessarily restricted to a scale. I mostly work with quantitative data and we do lots of statistical analysis for that. So in some of our human studies where we were looking at depressed and non-depressed participants, we've now had up to 240 participants through, so half in each of those groups. We started out with 60 depressed and 60 non-depressed and then the following year we collected another um, data from another 60 depressed and 60 non-depressed. So that's a huge amount of um, data that we have. So we do lots of analyses. We look at differences between depressed and non-depressed groups, but we also obviously want to see if gender has an impact. And then we collect a lot of data to do with their mental health perceptions. So they fill in lots and lots of surveys related to lots of aspects like their quality of life, how stressed they are, what their eating habits are like. And so we get 
lots of numbers for all of those different parts of information. What we do a lot of is correlations because we want to see a particular hormones related to particular symptoms or even groups of symptoms. So we might look at data from multiple questions that taken together give us an indication of how hostile someone is or their interpersonal connectedness. And then we can relate that score with say um, how much cortisol is in their, in their blood. Curiosity is my number one thing. There's so many things in the world that we don't know and there's so many things that I want to know, but I guess for me it's in the area of people's health and well-being. So I think that our modern lifestyle has introduced a lot of different stresses for people that are different to, you know, a few generations ago and that that's impacting the way we think and behave and interact with people. So I guess I like to read a lot in terms of the literature and see what's known and, and what new research is, is happening. And then I guess my approach is to see what gaps there are and where my strengths lie in terms of what I want to examine and the participants that we can recruit and work with to try and find some answers that ultimately would be to help people. So to help people with different mental health imbalances and um, during pregnancy and yeah, helping health and wellbeing. I think that actually money is a big influence in modern day scientific research. So for us here, we have lots of expenses. We use equipment, we use lab space and different facilities. We recruit participants in. And then once, for example, we've collected their blood, we need to separate out the plasma. And then we look at different hormone levels in their blood. And each time we do that, it costs a lot of money. So unfortunately, money can drive a lot of research but that can lead to things like competitiveness between researchers and sometimes it can take away from the quality and the original drive that was there. So I think it's really important that researchers can maintain their curiosity, that they can always remember why they're doing what they did because I think that what should drive us is still that quest for answers, you know, finding out what, uh, what we can add to what's already out there, trying to fill the gaps of knowledge and ultimately yeah, just to improve our lives in whatever way of research that is. Sometimes young researchers can be a little bit overwhelmed thinking, I don't have a specific question, you know, does that mean I'm not a good researcher? But they don't just pop into your mind. So it comes from being curious, but it also comes from speaking to others, from attending seminars and, and really staying on top of what's going on in your scientific field. For me, then it came through talking to people. So I spoke to a clinical psychologist. She shared what she thought was um, missing in the field of hormone research in mental health. I spoke to an osteopath who gave me some of his input in terms of some of the issues that pregnant women have. And so then it's sort of just a little idea that starts and it blossoms and, and then you need to read, you know, to see what evidence is already out there what's been done before, are there other questions that come up from that that then we can answer. So I do definitely think that collaboration is important because I think of it like a puzzle, putting a puzzle together. You know, if you have this giant puzzle of a, a landscape, there's lots of blue for the sky, there might be lots of green for the trees, and it takes a long time, you know, to put all those little green pieces together. And if someone else is putting all the blue bits together, then it helps you come together and you can start to see a bigger picture more quickly than if you were just working on one little bit yourself. So for me, one of the main parts of the process is involving others. We've all got our strengths, we've all got our interests, and it's impossible for one person to have read everything about a particular topic and, and to know everything about that. In areas of research that involve more of a clinical aspect, a lot of times those questions come from literally a question that's it there in clinical practice. So for example, an osteopath who I've collaborated with, he really saw in clinical practice that women during pregnancy who had weaker hip muscles were more likely to have back pain. So he had seen that and it was almost like it was a fact for him because he dealt with it all the time. So that was the specific question that he asked. He didn't go reading or looking at different information. It was something that uh, presented itself to him. So I think that's fairly common when um, people are seeing a, an issue all the time that the question is already there for them. Whereas other times the hypotheses and the questions are formed on what I think is some fact and then some ideas or some theories. So for example, in the depression research, we know that 
people who are depressed, a certain number of those people will actually not want to seek help. So they don't even want to speak to their family or friends and they won't ever want to go and see a psychologist. So that's a fact that a clinical psychologist has seen, that some people will seek help and some people won't seek help. In theory, different hormone imbalances could affect the way that people approach that and that you know different hormone imbalances could affect different symptoms of stress and depression. So the research questions for that research came from a fact looking at that there are differences in the way people approach help seeking along with some theories that, well, there are hormone imbalances between people, maybe that's something that contributes to it. So they're sort of the more open-ended, academic-based questions where we're really looking for answers. First of all, it's really looking at study design, so thinking, how many participants are we going to need? You know, where are we going to get them to come in? What are we looking for? That's a lot of collaborating with different people, planning for space, then we go through an ethics application where we have to you know, write up everything and, and really convince an ethics committee, which is made up of scientists but also lay people, to decide that what we're doing is appropriate because also they want to see that it's scientifically valid. They don't want us just to be you know, bringing people in here to contribute and give us their time for something that's not really worth it. So we have to get ethics approval. And then we can start recruiting. So for us, because we get um, humans, people to come in for our data collection, we recruit. So sometimes we recruit online or we can go to um, different places like the hospital. And then we, get, we have to book participants in for their data collection. We organise nurses to take blood and psychologists to interview those people. And that process can take a long time. So even to get 60 participants through, that can take a couple of months because we're getting them in at different times and different days. Then once we've collected their blood and we've gotten all their responses to the surveys, we put all of those numbers into Excel or we put them into a statistical program and then we can start doing our statistical analysis of the data. At that stage, it's good to also meet back with the collaborators and, and really talk through what we think is happening with the data, you know, what trends, what statistical significance we've found. And then it's really about putting that all together, writing up reports and disseminating those results. So we like to give feedback to our participants. It's also important and we love going to conferences to present our data and then writing up for a publication. I think the hardest part at all stages is the unknown. So for us dealing with people, you know, we even though you can do statistical tests to determine how many people you theoretically need if you're trying to look for a difference between two groups, it's not really exact. So it's always that worry of, you know, do we have enough people in these groups? Are we going to find the results that are adequate? So not to look for a specific result, but to ensure that we've got numbers to know that we can find differences. And then just, you know, booking people in, communicating with others, working around different people, I think is the hardest. But also to me, that's one of the best bits. So I love that I do work with people and, you know, everyone has their own time constraints and, and issues that come up, but that's kind of the richness of, of working with people and getting to know them a little bit as well. With our data that we collect in terms of the biological samples, so say from plasma, then when we're doing those hormone analysis, we always run in duplicate or triplicate. So for every sample, we run two or three so that we can take an average. We use kits that have been validated. So these kits come from a, a company and they're all, they have standards and, and reliability measures contained within them. When we're collecting other data, so things like blood pressure or when I'm doing the measures of muscle thickness with the ultrasound, we always collect in triplicate. So we take three measures and take the average of those measures. So a good example of us in terms of ensuring reliability is that we do additional reliability tests. So for example, we use an ultrasound machine to measure the thickness of a muscle, but we do that to measure the thickness of the muscle when it's relaxed and then when that's contracted. We do that in triplicate, so a passive measure and then a contracted measure three times. But because we're doing those on different days for different women, there's always the potential for some error because I'm a human myself, so I might not have the probe in exactly the same spot. So what we do is that we get some participants in and we just do 10 run-throughs of that same measure 
and then we do that again the week after as well so that we can see how close together our measures are so we can get sort of an idea of how reproducible I am as a person taking those measures so that then we know what sort of an error range that we can report um, with our actual results. We've done a pilot study for all of the research investigations that we're currently doing. So a pilot study is really important because it enables you to just see if everything runs. You know, we do a run through with, with someone that's not a real participant, just to check that everything works, that the blood taking is fine, that we've got all the equipment. But then obviously we wanna do studies where we've got a smaller number of participants, just to see if we're, um, we have enough numbers and if we're gonna really be able to get meaningful results. So pilot studies are really important just to, to check that everything works and that it's going to be useful. So we don't want to bring people in for a real larger study if that's wasting their time or wasting our time. The statistical tests are really there to enable us to decide whether our hypotheses are, are valid or not. So they're a really important part of the scientific research. For us, we do a lot of t-tests and ANOVAs because we're comparing between two or three or more groups. So that's when we can compare means between the different groups. We sometimes do two-way or mixed ANOVAs because we might want to see if there's a difference, for example, between depressed and non-depressed participants, but also if that's confounded by gender. So we're looking at depressed and non-depressed and male and female. So the statistical tests really enable us to look at lots of different combinations. We also do lots of correlations because in that research, we collect a lot of different data and we really want to see are different hormones correlated? Are they correlated with any of the measures of, of mental health and quality of life? And then sometimes we do multiple regression analysis, which is kind of like mixed or multiple correlations where we might want to see, for example, if there's a particular behavior such as eating behaviors that can be common in people with depression if they have sort of food addiction, we might put in a lot of different independent variables to see how that affects that one particular dependent variable. So we might be looking at sex and at their depression score and lots of different things to see if we can find a combination of variables that predicts one particular outcome measure. In our research looking at um, mental health measures and the hormones, we do correlations because it's more of a snapshot measure. So the hormones can vary a lot between individuals, as can obviously all those measures of mental health. So because we're just looking at a per person, per time point basis, we can only do correlations. We just want to see is there a um, relation between, say, for example, high cortisol levels in the blood and high feelings of anger or hostility? We wouldn't be able to do a causation in that instance because unless we gave someone a particular dose of cortisol for a certain amount of time and monitored their, their behaviour, we can only do correlations. And obviously there's lots of ethical issues with that. But having said all that, we're extending our research at the moment to look at different eating patterns in people with mental health issues. So there's information out there that says that people with depression can have higher rates of food addiction. So we've actually recently recruited some participants who have depression who are also putting on weight and those who have depression and are losing weight. And what we've done is we've still taken those same measures at that one time point, but we're gonna get those participants back in three months and do the measures again. So we want to see if we can really find out if there are particular triggers or particular hormone levels that change that are actually affecting that weight gain or weight loss. When we've finished all of that research process and we have the results and we've thought about them in the context of, of other results and the clinical application, we will write all that up as a big report that will be published hopefully in a journal. So these journals are very important and they get read by the wider scientific community. One of the best parts of our job as scientists is to then go to conferences. I pick all my conferences based on where they are in the world and we can go there and present our findings to an international audience or national if it's in Australia obviously. And then people will usually do oral presentations or poster presentations. But in addition to that, that's a great way just to communicate, you know, over lunch or at a break with colleagues that are in the field. And that's another place where you can get further ideas for, for different aspects of research because there'll always be a real variety of people there. Closer to home, I definitely like to communicate to my colleagues within the department. You know, it's always good to know what people are doing, whether there's potential other collaborations here. 
it's important to communicate back to the participants where we can. And sometimes, you know, we'll go on local radio and, and maybe give sort of a take home message. So obviously the thing that's interesting and important as well is that the language will change depend on, depending on where I'm communicating that. And then lastly, I use it in my teaching. So I do like to include for the students some of our research outcomes. These students are training to be medical doctors. So it's good for them to realise what's happening in the world of scientific research too. I think anyone who's got even any interest in science as they're going through school should just remain open-minded. So I think that if you've got that inquisitive mind and nature, that you will probably be drawn to a scientific pursuit. But I think not to worry that you don't need to know early on exactly what you want to do. You know, personally, I'm someone who likes to be more of a jack of all trades rather than master of none. So I like to be across the board in terms of diversity. I think it's good just to, yeah, be open-minded to, to really, to go along to as much as you can if there's an interesting seminar or um, see what you enjoy as you go through school and, and uni in terms of what subjects you like because the main thing in science is that you need to follow your passion. So it's something that becomes an interest as well. And so I think it's important to make sure that you're doing what you like. You need to be yeah, communicative to others, to definitely realise that you don't always know the right way and that others will help you find you know, different aspects and they'll help you answer those questions that you don't know. So I think the main thing is, is working with others to realise that we can all contribute a small part. And yeah, but along the way, it's, it's super interesting meeting lots of people and always just learning more.